A book of Amos is a famous book and a controversial one used by people for different purposes, such as Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream speech quotes from this book, chapter 5, verse 24. Let justice roll down. He used this scripture to denounce the religious hypocrisy and economic inequality. The connection between social justice and Amos was strongly secured during the civil rights movement in the 1970s. However, ironically, the same verse also used by some conservative Christians, such as the poor life Christians, to denounce those people who are too liberal they are afraid that they will bring the evil behavior back to the humankind and bring the humankind back to the black, age, uh, the black age and they will earn the punishment from God, the wrath of God. So it's very, always difficult to understand the scripture like this today. There are five visions of Amos from God in this book. The scripture today is among those visions. The first vision is the punishment from locusts. Locusts ate all the grass and the harvest in the northern kingdom. But Amos asked for to be spared, and God answered accordingly. The second vision is a punishment from fire. The fire from the sky burned all the properties on earth, especially in the northern kingdom. And Amos again asked for to be spared, and God answered accordingly. The fourth vision is, the, is a basket of fruit. It represents the end of time for Israel, the northern kingdom, and God will spare no more. The fifth and the final vision is the destruction of Israel, the northern kingdom. God stood beside the altar of the temple, Bethel, and the altar was shattered, and no one could escape from the temple. The scripture says, The eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. The third vision today comes with the conversation after that. The vision today we are talking about is the, the plumb line. The plumb line is known as the measurement of a foundation of the wall or of a building. If the wall and the foundation are leveled, aligned with the plumb line, then this building, the wall, will be solid and strong. But if not, the wall and the building will be in a great danger. People inside that will be in great danger too. So this vision provides us with the idea that God, that God holds a standard and uses it as a measurement to judge the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, in this narrative. We knew that after the death of King, da uh, King Solomon, the kingdom of David was set, divided into two entities. The northern entity is called Israel. The capital was Shechem, Tzadat, and then Samaria. And the southern entity is called Judah. Jerusalem was the capital. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed in the 8th century BCE by the Assyrian Empire. The southern kingdom, Judah, was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire in the 6th century BCE. The scripture continued to address the high places of Isaac should be made desolate, and the sectionaries of Israel should be laid west, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with sword, and God will spare them no more. You also know that there were two sectionaries, sectionaries in Israel, compared to only one in Judah, which is in uh, Jerusalem. There are two sectionary and temple in the north, 
is a temple den on the border of the tri den, and the temple Bethel, which was closer to Jerusalem, is the same temple we mentioned today. The vision indicates none of Israel's sanctuary or the kingship of the northern kingdom would survive, but only the temple in the south and the kingdom in the south. So what went wrong with the northern kingdom, Israel? This was also the concern of the priest, Amaziah. Before Amaziah reported to the king, Jeroboam, what Amos had said on the street. Amaziah asked Amos to leave and never prophesy again in Israel, but to earn his living in the south. It, which, uh, which means it seems that for Amaziah, Amos is a person who earned a living by saying things let people feel happy or be paid by people to say anything they want to hear. But also from the same scripture, we can learn more about Amos. Amos is not a born prophet. He's not born from the prophet house. He's not trained to be a professional prophet. But he, he, he was just a herdman and dresser of sycamore trees. He was called by God and sent by God from the deep south Judah to prophesy to the people of Israel in the north. The conversation implies that Amos did not speak for his living or benefit, but merely being the messenger of God. We might have some question in our mind. What really went wrong with the northern kingdom? And what does this plumb line represent? If, if we were like Amaziah, the priest of the temple of Bethel, we might be thinking, what's going on here? A thousand guide come up here with no education, no background, and he tried to say something against me, against my king, against my kingdom, even against the temple. What's going on? How could these people do this to us? I will try to just confront with this person. For them, for us, for me, especially for me, I am more capable of prophesying and knowing better everything here, not you, Amos from the thousand. Some of, some of us might have been told before about the correct, so-called quote, correct and proper answer why Amos was sent by God. Some might point out that Israel worshipped other gods and deities, had gold clubs, and did something behaving like prostitutes. The priests of Bethel and Dan did not follow the commandment or protocol from God. They lost their responsibility or the, the role of leading the worship. The feature or the function of the temple was also lost. So there's no reason for God to keep the temple in the northern kingdom, letting the enemy Letting the enemies to ruin the temple is God's plan. Someone might have been told like that. It might sound quite comprehensive to us, especially if we compare to the first king, chapter 12, that King Jeroboam misled the people of Israel. From the intertextual reading between Amos and the first king, it's easier to use religious differences and divisions to judge a person, a leader, and a kingdom, a group of people. Or on the contrary, by using religious excuses to justify personal or communal uh, agenda. However, the archaeology tells us another story. Evidence discovered at the site of Dan and Bethel indicate the worshipping behavior lie in those two places during the Neo-Babylonian and Assyrian time. Their behavior is exactly the same as the one in Jerusalem. Exactly the same. Nothing else different. Which means the religious and the liturgist factor 
should not be the reason to condemn the northern kingdom, especially not to condemn the priest of Bethel, Amaziah, and his family. Bethel means the house of the Most High, the house of God. Apparently, Bethel was the center of God's worshiping, the same as Jerusalem. So what went wrong in this temple? What went wrong in this uh, kingdom? It comes to the second question in our mind, in, especially from this narrative. What does the plumb line represent and where to find it? These are some clues in the book of Amos. In chapter 3, God said, Assemble yourself on Mount Samaria and see what great thumped and within it what oppressions are in its midst. They do not know how to do right, says the Lord, those who stored up violence and robbery in their strongholds. In chapter 4, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on Mount Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy. I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a bread snatched from the fire, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. In chapter 5, God said, They hate the one who, who, who reproved in the gate, and they abhorred one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trembled on the poor and take them from and take from them leaves of grass. In the famous and controversial scripture, Amos chapter 5, 24, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream, which is allocated after God's asking for the removal of worship, offering assemblings could be understood as it was not the religious worship factors or component that insulted God. It indicated the lack of hospitality, exploitation of the poor, and the silence toward the injustice are the reasons God wanted to condemn the temple of Bethel, the priest and the king and the kingdom. It's about the real, suffered, and disadvantaged lives that God cares. But those who worship God did not. Those who led the worship did not. And those who lead the country did not. And this condition drove God angry. But there is no longer a divine presence, but a harp of oppressors of the poor, a plunderer, of a plunderer to the ordinary people. In other words, the punishment toward the priest Amaziah and the king and the king Jeroboam aimed at the elites of the Israel who took advantage of the disadvantages. Their worship and religious value become hypocrisy, hypocritic element and God hated it very much. It's ironic to see that Amos, a nobody from the south sent by God, point out their failure, crime, and sin, and the reason to be ruined. It reminds us a children's story that a king is naked but nobody wants to point out the king's naked. Only a child point out, you are naked. Emma just died this child, point out to the king, you are naked. Point out to the priest of Bethel, you are naked. The plumb line mentioned in Emma's visions, I believe, refer to the condition of the visible poor and the suffered people, fighting those disadvantaged people who were robbed is finding the plumb line. Therefore, the elimination of injustice is a foundation of a sectionary of the divine. The religious and political 
hypocrisy is to be condemned. In our context today, we have so much to do to prevent this kind of punishment. This one example. On June 28th, Reuters, a famous uh, journal online uh, located in UK, reports on his website titled, The U.S. Supreme Court Takes Aim at Separation of Church and State. The opening statement of this article says, The conservative majority U.S. Supreme Court had chipped away the war celebrating church and state in a series of a new rulings, eroding Americans' legal traditions intended to prevent government officials from promoting any particular faith. In three decisions in the past eight weeks, the court has ruled against government officials who, whose, whose policies and actions were taken to avoid violating the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment prohibitions on the governmental endorsement of, religious, of religions known as the established class. The article also indicates the court's conservative judges, in particular, have taken a broad view of religious rights. They also delivered a decision on Friday, which is June 24th. On Friday, that was held by religious conservatives, overturning the 1973 Roy versus Wade ruling the legalized abortion. Decision makings premised on the so called quote, secular, secularized. Secur uh, secularism, a secularized value, secularized world, is the target of this series of Supreme Court ruling. Says by a Cornell Law School professor, Michael C. Dorf. I learned, we learn from our history when Christianity combined with the political power, always come up with a very bad ending such as the early church, the Christianity combined with the Roman Empire. Christian agenda become the Roman Empire's agenda. It was the darkest time of humankind. Collaborations defeat the unconditional love and the strength of grace. It is a shame that religious formalism has become the core value of the Supreme Court, which was supposed to guarantee the freedom of everyone in this country from any kind of oppressions or inequality, regardless of their background, sex, gender, and religious belief, by endorsing the Christian agenda and idea alone. Those non-Christians or those cannot pass Christians like me are about to suffer. Abortion is not merely a topic, but it's about the people whose rights are now being taken away. They cannot be themselves anymore. The image of God are broken now. They are robbed and now naked. Letting the disadvantaged people suffer is not what Amos God would prefer. Today is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Each of us here today could be Amos, a nobody, but filled with the Holy Spirit and the courage. We are capable of speaking the truth and pointing out the failure at the face of the power. Tell people the plumb line from the poor's perspective. Although our denominations have different progress on this topic, Reproductive justice is supported, still supported, by the United Church of Christ and the Presbyterian Church USA. It's the time for all of us to join different kind of force and the caucus to form a force, raise our voice, and deliver the message. 
our explicit behavior reveal us as a disciple of Christ who will stand in solidarity with the poor and take care of the robbed and overturn the table against the den of robbers. Facing these circumstances, I want to call from Martin Luther King Jr. from his speech. We should say to these circumstances, no, no, no. We are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream in our life, in our country, and among us. Amen. <laughs>